Thank you very much, Sarah. Morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's been so good to be here this morning, so, so refreshing, so encouraging, and uh, the Lord is good. We're beginning a new teaching series today. Um, we do sort of structure the teaching here at MCF on a Sunday morning. Hopefully you've noticed that. Um, we've come to the end of a short thematic series about prayer, and now we're going to do what might be called uh, Through the Book series. And we're going to the last book in the Old Testament, the final book in the Old Testament, book of Malachi. And today I'm just going to introduce this book a little bit and speak from verses 1 to 5. So I'll read those to you now. Malachi 1, verse 1. A prophecy. The word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. And a heading. Israel doubts God's love. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I've turned his hill, hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom, that's Esau's descendants, may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of God. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. It's the word of the Lord for us today. I wonder if you've ever had good reason to doubt somebody's love for you. Maybe your father. Maybe your mother, one of your children, the love of a friend that you've had for a very long time, even your spouse, all of which at the very least can be hugely disappointing and at worst, of course, can be deeply distressing to feel you've lost the love of somebody who loved you so deeply. But if as a follower of Jesus, that someone whose love you've had reason to doubt is God's, might that not cause an even deeper distress, an even greater sense of pain and loss, doubting God's love? That's my little title for this morning as we begin this five-Sunday study of Malachi. Our God has plainly told us that he loves us unreservedly. Never asked Sarah to quote that verse from the Old Testament, I have loved you with an everlasting love, but God said that to his people. He loves us unreservedly. So why then should we ever have any reason to doubt the love of God? Well, I think this tiny little piece of ancient Israeli history reveals at least three of the possible reasons why on occasions we may possibly begin to doubt the love of God. And we're going to get to those a little bit later, but before we do... We're going to begin with the book's introduction. In verse 1, the book's introduction, which simply states a prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. So who was Malachi? Where did Malachi live? When did he bring this word of the Lord? Was it just a few years before Jesus came? Was it a lot further back in time? More importantly, why did he bring it? What was going on in Israel? What wasn't going on in Israel that necessitated such a strong word? And it really is a strong word from the Lord that runs throughout this book. And I think few people answer those questions so clearly and graphically as the good folk at the Bible Project. And if you haven't discovered the Bible Project on YouTube, have a look at it. And we're going to watch and listen to the first 85 seconds. Yes, 85 seconds not 90, 85, of their Malachi video. So Sam, if you put that on for us, we've got a bit of sound, we'll watch that together. <clears throat> the book of the prophet Malachi. He lived about 100 years after the Israelites had returned from their Babylonian exile. And his message was directed to the people who had been living in Jerusalem for some time now. The temple had been rebuilt a while ago and things were not going well. Just remember the stories from Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, when the Israelites first returned from exile, their hopes were high. They would return and rebuild their lives and the temple, all of the great promises of the prophets would come true. The Messiah would come and set up God's kingdom over a unified Israel and over the nations and bring justice and peace for all. But that's not 
what happened. The Israelites who repopulated the city proved to be just as unfaithful to God as their ancestors, resulting in poverty and injustice. And so in Malachi, we find out just how corrupt this new generation has become. The book's designed as a series of disputes, and most sections begin with God saying something, making a claim or an accusation, and then Israel will disagree or question God's statement. And then God will respond and offer the last word. This happens six times. In the first three disputes, God exposes Israel's corruption, and in the final three disputes, he confronts their corruption. And the overall impression you get from these arguments and disputes is that the exile fundamentally didn't change anything in the people. Israel's hearts are as hard as ever. Israel's hearts are as hard as ever. That's what our narrator said. That's how he summarized how the people were when they returned from exile. Um, and this is some years after that. But that in seven short words is why God raised up Malachi. Because the people's hearts were hard towards the Lord. Now Malachi might possibly be more of a job description than a literal name. Because the word literally means my Messenger, it means the messenger of Yahweh or the messenger of God. But whether it's a title or a name, the rest of the verse makes it very clear that his message was a word of the Lord and therefore should be taken very seriously. This message was coming through Malachi, but from God. An Old Testament professor by the name of David Baker has written a very helpful commentary on the book of Malachi, and he makes this very challenging comment on this verse, particularly for those of us who have the privilege of preaching and teaching the Bible. He says, it's vital to note the difference between the source of the message, who is God, and its conduit or its channel, its preacher or messenger. Because as a preacher, he says, it's too easy to slip into the feeling that the authority lies in me rather than in the word. Lack of diligence In studying the word, he continues, lack of fervor in prayer over that word, lack of pastoral contact with the people and their hurts and desires, make it easy to no longer speak God's message to the people, but our own message with no real concern for God whatsoever. That can happen. Friends, it's not the speaker's bright ideas that matter. It's not my words. It's not Tim's words, Graham's words, Mike's words, David's words, Richard's words. It's God's words. That matter. It's how faithfully those words of his are explained and applied to our lives. That's every preacher's brief to unpack the words of God. The book's introduction God's people had become both careless and complacent. Their hearts were hard, their worship was cold and predictable. And as Mary Evans puts it in her little book about the prophets, she says they acted not so much as if God did not exist, but as if he were of no account. So the Lord sends Malachi, a messenger, to challenge them, to chide them. And sometimes we need that challenge too, don't we? Because it's all too easy to live that way ourselves. For our hearts to become hard. For our worship to become Predictable. So moving on, what's the first thing God says to his people through Malachi? I'm calling this the Lord's declaration because verse 2 begins, I have loved you, says the Lord. I've loved you. Apparently, Malachi's words, more literally translated, mean something closer to this. I have loved you in the past and I still do. Or to put it another way, I have always loved you and I still love you. How long uh, had Israel been a nation by this time? Well, if we date it from the Exodus, Malachi's prophecy, something like 500 BC, date it to the Exodus, that's 900 to 1,000 years earlier. And if we were to go back to Abraham and God's calling of him from Ur, then around another 600 years before that. Thanks, Sam. And God had loved them all that time through all their ups and downs. Through their believing and their backsliding, God had loved them. That's 1,500 years of faithful loving in spite of their rebellion, their hardness of heart, their idolatry, their disobedience. 
And what was it that caused God to love these people in the first place? Was it their size and their strength as a nation? Not at all. Because they were small. They were weak compared to other nations of the world. Was it their geographical location? No, it wasn't because God moved Abraham on and he brought Israel somewhere else. It wasn't where they were living that God liked. Was it their moral goodness then? Was it their religious fervor? Well, no, again, because they certainly had their share of rogues and, and heathens. And couldn't care less people. Thanks, Sam. So why love Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in such a demonstrable way? Why set his love on this family line of Shem as opposed to Ham or Japheth, Noah's other two sons? Why is the Bible essentially the story of one human family and those people who by the grace of God have been grafted into it? Great question. The only answer I can offer you, the only satisfactory answer I've ever heard can be stated in just two words, sovereign grace. (laughs) Sovereign grace. In other words, God in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, sovereignly, sovereignly and graciously set his heart on the human family into which his own son would eventually be born. God so loved the world, said John, and he does. He did and he still does. 100%. God loves the world. But it was with Noah and it was with Abraham and it was with David that God made his first covenants, those history-shaping promises and commitments to preserve and to bless his people. This is love, said John again, not that we loved God but that he loved us. That's grace. Not worthy of it, but he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Friends, you are loved by God. And if you ever reach a stage in your life where you feel that no one else in the world loves you, God loves you passionately, deeply, everlastingly. Not on the basis of the old covenant of law, but on the new covenant of grace. And so says John, we know and we rely on the love God has for us. 1 John 4, verse 6. Next slide, please. The people's reservation. Still in verse 2, because the people replies to God. God says, I've loved you. And the people say, how have you loved us? How? They were doubting. Doubting God's love because they were asking for proof of it. Demanding examples of how God had loved them. Can I suggest to you three possible reasons for these doubts? And I do so because I think each of them can be mirrored in the lives of Christians today. Reason number one, they had forgotten all God had done for them as a people. They clearly had forgotten it all. Their their question betrays a loss of key memories. How? How? Have you loved us, God? In other words, they don't seem to have been able to recall a single example of God's love for them. Their deliverance from evil, uh, Egypt, the Red Sea parted, God's giving of the law, the provision of bread and water in the wilderness, the walls of Jericho falling just by marching around them, the defeat of Goliath and the Philistines, the glory days of David, their return from exile, the rebuilding of the temple. Do you want me to go on? It's one of the reasons. Jesus asks us to remember him with bread and wine so that we would never doubt God's love for us. Revealed in what Jesus did for us at the cross, they have bad memories. We should encourage ourselves to remember the great things God has done for us, not just in our lifetime, but things he did even before we were born to make it possible for us to be the children of God. Second reason I want to suggest to you is this, that they had lost their passion for worship. In other words, their worship of the living God had degenerated into mere form and mere ritual. As we'll begin to see in the weeks to come, their sacrifices were second best, at best. Second-rate sacrifices, animals that weren't completely well, completely whole, Their priest's teaching was seriously flawed. 
Their offerings were the feeble fruits of duty rather than the generous gifts of gratitude. Their worship was sterile. It was lifeless. They were just going through the motions rather than expressing their emotions in joyful worship and in heartfelt praise. What happens, friends, when we worship the Lord with passion and enthusiasm? I'll tell you what happens. God blesses our hearts. He does. He blesses our minds. He blesses our spirits with reminders of his love. When we worship him passionately, how many times have I stood in this place over nearly 22 years now as we've worshipped the Lord and have been moved? Moved sometimes to the depth of my being by the love of God. How often has that happened? Many, many times. It's happened again this morning as we sang thank you for the cross, Lord. The third reason they doubted God's love, their concept of God's love, I think, was flawed, fundamentally flawed. And I confess to you that this one owes probably more to my conjecture than it does to exegesis of the Bible, but I'd imagine that these people were people whose concept of love was somewhat fluffy. Can I use that word? No real substance to it. Sentimental as opposed to sacrificial. All grace, no discipline. All gifts, no demands. Fluffy love. That's what they felt God had, I think. They only saw nice things and pleasant experiences as being examples of God's love and having anything to do with God's mighty love. But God's love is neither sloppy nor soppy. You might remember that little phrase. It's got a ring to it, hasn't it? It's neither sloppy nor soppy is the love of God. It's kind, but when needed, it's tough. God's love is deep, but when needed, it, it flows out by way of rebuke. Are you with me? Do we doubt God's love because we never seem to feel it? Do we question God's love for us because he doesn't seem to take away our pain? Do we, do we ask him how he's loved us, loved us, loved us, I'll get it out eventually, if he leaves us all alone? Do we? Some of you know the name Elizabeth Elliot. She died about seven years ago, this past week actually. She lost her missionary husband, Jim when he was speared to death by Huarani Indians in the jungles of Ecuador. And yet she later asked this question in one of her books. Does our faith rest on having prayers answered as we think they should be answered? Or does it rest on that mighty love that went down into death for us? Wow, what a great question. And despite what had happened to her in losing her husband so terribly, she also later testified in another of her books. She said, we are always held in the love of God. There was a woman who experienced that in the weeks and the months and the years after Jim was uh, so tragically killed. May God help us never to doubt the love of God. It's deep and it's strong and it's eternal. And fourthly and finally, the Lord's affirmation, which raises an interesting question because the Lord replies, and I'm sure you noticed it and probably took a gasp as I read it to you, was not Esau Jacob's brother, yet I've loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Oh dear. Malachi's made a blunder. Because how could God ever hate anyone? Doesn't John say that God is love? How then could this phrase also be true? Esau, I have hated. Let me say this to you. When we come across a verse or a phrase in the Bible like this one in the course of our regular reading of it that seems to contradict our present understanding of God's word, then we have two choices as to what we do with that phrase. Next slide, Sam, please. One of those choices is to say to ourselves, that cannot be true. For example, how can God have chosen me when I chose him? 
In other words, we're saying the Bible is clearly in error at that point, which implies that the human author got it wrong or that God's spirit got it wrong when he inspired the author to say it, both of which might cause us to reason if the Bible got it wrong on that one, then maybe there are many more such errors sprinkled through Scripture. So can I really trust it? The other choice, the one that I would urge you to adopt on every such occasion, is to carry on believing. Scripture never gets it wrong. In which case, you have two further choices. The first choice is, is just to accept by faith that both of those statements are true. God loved Jacob, hated Esau. Just accept it and move on if you believe in the word of God. But the other choice is to believe both are true and then to further study the matter in order to try and discover just how that might be possibly the case. Which is what I did with this one. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. How could that possibly be, I asked myself this week. So I started reading helpful articles on trusted websites. I stress the word trusted because there's some bonkers ones out there. Gotquestions.org is pretty reliable. So I turned to that. number of commentaries on Malachi that I'm fortunate to have my bookshelf from authors and publishers I found to be reliable, who honour the word of God. Here's what I discovered. First of all, that my own hunch about the answer was incorrect. Because I put it down to the use of hyperbole. Exaggerated statement that's not intended to be taken totally literally or seriously at face value. I was actually chewing this over and I was on a farm walk uh, on the edge of Martok and I was just walking and I was thinking about this. I was turning over in my head, God, how can it be you loved Jacob but hated Esau? And I came to a place on the path where the, the, the sort of downtrodden way had virtually been taken over by a huge crop on the one side that was about up there and nettles and, and grass on the other side that was about up there and the path between it was like this. I thought, I'm hating this. I'm really hating this. But then I thought, no, I'm not. I don't actually hate it. Because I was still seeing butterflies, still saw the odd demoiselle, the sun was still shining, didn't go on forever, that path. It was just that in comparison to the rest of the walk, I really didn't like it. So I found myself saying, oh, I'm hating this. Untrue. Friends, Jesus used the word hate in that sense. In one of his hard sayings, he didn't literally mean we're to hate our loved ones. He didn't. He was using hyperbole to drive home a point about our love for him. In comparison to our love for him, our love for our parents must be almost very verging towards hate because we're to have such a passionate love for Jesus. But of course, we're not to hate them, we're to love them. But that's not what Malachi was doing. He wasn't using hyperbole. His use of the word hate, or rather God's use of it, had more to do with covenants. Covenants God made with, with Israel's forebears, Malachi's ancestors, commenting on the hate word. David Becker says this. I think it's really helpful. He says its meaning derives from the context. That's usually the case in interpreting scripture, which in this text does not concern a strong emotional aversion, which is a major element of the English term hate. In the covenant context, he says, the one who is loved is a covenant ally. The one hated is outside that covenant relationship. So it's not hatred in the sense that we think of the word. It's the difference between the one who's the ally and the one who's the enemy. Then again, got questions, website, brief article on this specific phrase reads like this. So considering the context, God loving Jacob and hating Esau has nothing to do with human emotions of love and hate. It has everything to do with God choosing one man and his descendants and rejecting another man and his descendants. Ah, but God didn't choose me. Say, son, I chose him. To which I would respectfully pose the question, are you greater than God then? 
You're greater than God. You're telling me you're allowed to choose him, but he's not allowed to choose you? Is that what you're saying? He's the sovereign Lord who acts in sovereign grace. The book's introduction, God was speaking to his people, friends, and he still is today, through this very same word, actually, as we hope to see in the course of the next four or five weeks. He loves his people, and he still loves his people with the same covenant love as he ever did. The people's reservation, they were doubting the love of God, and some still do, because they forget all that God has ever done for them. And the Lord's affirmation, he chose his people, yet they still had a will to choose him. Doubting God's love, if that's you today, or ever is again, remind yourself of the wonderful things, the eternal things that God has already done for you. Worship him passionately for who he is and will always be, and he will bless you with his love. And remember Job's words to his wife. Never had the courage to say this, but Job's words to his wife. Should we accept only good things? From the hand of God and never anything bad. May God bless you and keep you until such time as he calls you home. Trusting in the mighty love of God. Enjoying it every day. Amen.